Okay, time has come. Welcome to 2020 DCMI Virtual. And this is Sam O, who is the chair of DCMI Governing Board. I think this is a challenging and exciting time. The DCMI Virtual Organizing Team took this challenge and did our best. I believe we managed to create exciting program for this year. Please enjoy the event for the next two, year, two, uh, two weeks. With that, I am extremely honored to introduce our keynote speaker, a beloved friend, Stu Weibel. The title of his talk is 2020 Vision, Reflections on a, a Quarter Century of Metadata. You know, in the beginning, Dublin Core workshops were held in one big room, and Stu was the master of ceremonies. And walking around with a microphone to encourage discussion, at the start of the first session, he would walk out on a stage, and before he even uh, say a word, he would hold up a camera and took a picture of the audience. He does that every year. <laughs> no, I'm just doing it now. It was a nice and welcoming gesture that seemed to say to us all, this meeting is about you, the community. In today's circumstances, we are meeting on Zoom but still a new and challenging environment, but I think Stu would agree this is still about community and about learning from each other's experience in this rapidly changing world. Stu was a co-organizer of the early Dublin Core workshops and conferences. He helped to bring a loosely organized collection of global expertise together to form the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative and directed it for, uh, for the first uh, decade of its ex uh, existence. Our community is so grateful to his leadership and the paving our way to be the finest community in handling innovative metadata solutions. Please use uh, Q&A windows to ask questions while you are listening to the keynote, since I will be go through them first. Without further delay, let's welcome him so we can be entertained and challenged. Stu, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, Sam. I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. It's, um, um, I know we all wish that things were a little bit different than they are right now, but this is just another of, among many, many challenges that uh, we've uh, encountered and, and um, uh, surpassed over the years. So today what I want to talk to you about is a little bit of the early history of the Dublin Core. I'd like to describe to you what I think some of the major conditions for success have been. I want to talk about some of the metaphors that we've used to try to communicate our vision both to ourselves and to others. Some of the challenges identify some of the things that I think are important about what we've achieved and some hopes for the future. So before I start that, I'd like to tell you a, what I think is kind of a funny story. Back in the early days of the web, um, there was something called the M-Bone, which was uh, kind of the earliest version of uh, video conferencing. It was, it was uh, um, someone, it took a big team of uh, electronic wizards to run the whole thing. And I think in the early days that they said that we brought down the internet in Germany on one occasion. I was in Germany to help organize one of the early web conferences and one of our committee members couldn't be there. So it's just a half dozen or eight of us. And one of our members was in uh, the States and uh, he was determined to contribute. So he went into his office at uh, three o'clock in the morning dressed in a suit and tie and, and uh, was on, on the, the M-Bone to participate in our organizational meeting. And he was projected up on a wall so that his head was eight feet tall. And for this entire meeting, all we could do is to, you couldn't take your attention away from this eight foot wizard uh, being projected up, up on the screen. And it only, the picture only changed about every three seconds. And so we were, we were really, uh, you know, you would just sit there and watch and the, the screen would freeze and it would just go through image after image. And the only thing I remember from that meeting is that eight foot image projected up on that screen. So I hope that our, our technology is a little bit better these days and, <laughs> uh, and we're gonna be able to participate a little bit more effectively than that particular one. So 
who I am. I think uh, many of you would have heard of me as referred to as the father of the Dublin Corps. I've always disliked that, uh, <laughs> that, that name. I, I certainly never felt that way. I feel rather more like a midwife than a father. So please don't call me the father of the Dublin Corps. Actually, the midwife of the Dublin Corps doesn't sound all that great either, but I hope you get the idea. I was in the Office of Research uh, at OCLC for 25 years, and um, most of the last half of that time, I, I managed uh, the, the Dublin Corps. Uh, so uh, for about 10 years. Now I'm retired. I've been retired for six or eight years, and I look after a wooden boat. Coincidentally, that boat was built the year that the Dublin Corps started. So that was always one of the appeals of that particular <laughs> boat for me. In a normal year, I'd be at the Port Townsend Wooden Boat Festival today. It's my favorite event. I go there every year. But of course, this isn't a normal year. So we're going to look back then to the uh, beginning of, of our own activities. There's uh, many, many quotations by Mark Twain, only a few of which he actually said. But this is one of my favorite. And you can determine for yourself whether it's true or not. I've always been embarrassed by, by praise. I never feel like they've said enough. And I've felt that for many years about the Dublin Corps. I, I have often been credited with things that, ideas that belong to other people. And the picture on your screen right now is simply a group of those other people. This was from the Canberra meeting, which was our, our fourth meeting in 1997. And um, those early meetings, I think at the Canberra meeting, it was still, I don't remember if it was invitational now or not, but it was still a fairly small group. And that's the group that met in Canberra uh, for that particular meeting. So it's these people that have attended these meetings all over the world that have worked very hard. Uh, usually it hasn't been the major job that they've had, but they worked very hard and very passionately to develop the Dublin Corps. And enough is never said about the people that have participated. And those of you on the call today stand in that role today. And, and uh, I, I think the activity is in, in good hands in that respect. So this is a, one of my favorite cartoons, XKCD. I'm sure many of you have seen it. And I saw this one just recently as I was preparing slides for this meeting. And it's, uh, you can see at the very bottom, there's some little project, some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. Well, I feel that's sort of the, the role that the Dublin Corps has played in the internet. We're among the earliest of uh, technical uh, working groups and activities that have been contributing to World Wide Web infrastructure. And, um, uh, you know, we haven't been laboring away in a room in Nebraska, but um, we've certainly done what we've done on a shoestring. The Dublin Core Metadata Initiative has never uh, been very rich. I don't think there's an example of an organization who's contributed to web technology that has done more to contribute to that technology with less in the way of resources. It's the people that have always been our resource. Okay, so how we got started then. Um, I've told this story for many, many years. At the top of your screen, you see the the, uh, uh, the little pins that used to be given out at the Dublin, I'm sorry, at the World Wide Web meetings. And uh, the one in the middle is the one for the Chicago meeting in uh, 1994. It was the second international World Wide Web conference. It took place in Chicago in 94. And between a couple of the sessions, there was a hall conversation uh, among myself, Yuri Rubinsky, Joseph Harden of NCSA, Terry Neralt, who is my boss at OCLC, Eric Miller, my colleague there, and myself. And we were just talking about how even in those very early years, it was very difficult to find things. You knew that something was out there, but you didn't know how to find it. And it was Yuri who said, why don't we get some people together and see if we can work on that and tell, help fix it. And well, fools rush in where uh, braver people are uh, uh, fear to tread. And 
Eric and I looked at each other and kind of raised our eyebrows. And I looked at my boss, Terry, and I got kind of a nod from him. I said, we'll do that. And so Eric and I left the Chicago meeting with the task of organizing a workshop. And we knew the next web meeting, the uh, one uh, pin on the, on the uh, right of your screen, um, was going to be in Darmstadt in only a few months, six or seven or eight months, something like that. And we wanted to have a, a meeting that we could um, present the results of at that meeting. And so, um, you know, when we volunteered to do it, we didn't realize quite the challenge that would be. We had to figure out who to invite. We had to figure out an agenda and uh, what we actually wanted to accomplish. So Eric and I went back to Dublin, Ohio, where OCLC is, and we uh, started to uh, organize um, a meeting. So some of the things that, that really were in our favor at that point, first of all, I have to put in a plug here for OCLC. OCLC uh, was and is a global not-for-profit uh, library technology company. Um, it has member libraries from literally all over the world, all over the globe, and by and large, it's a, uh, it enjoys broad international trust. Terry Neralt, as I mentioned, was director of research, and he, uh, he was always very supportive of our efforts. Management at OCLC in the early years, well, it was, I, I guess you could describe it as benign neglect. They didn't really know what we were doing off in the Office of Research all that much, but as long as we didn't do anything to embarrass them, they were happy to let us do it. So they were supportive, and as time went on, and the Dublin Corps started to acquire a measure of uh, notoriety. Um, and uh, they were very supportive. And Jay Jordan, who was the CEO in those years, was a very enthusiastic supporter of our efforts. So the second set of conditions for success, we had a problem set of global proportions. You know, we thought, as I said, at the Mosaic Conference in Chicago, there were already 100,000 objects in the web and they were sometimes difficult to find. Um, well, most large organizations have uh, 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 webs that are larger than that right now, but it was big enough that we already recognized that it was a problem to find things. Keep in mind that the web at that point in time was the Wild West. It was the hottest ticket in town. When we were organizing the, the web conferences, the early ones, some of the staff that we had working on, on those activities got bribes for people to get to the meetings. Um, in particular, uh, when we were organizing the Chicago conference, um, somebody offered uh, one of the organizers a free trip to Paris for her and her husband if they would if, if they could get a ticket to go to the meeting. So it was, it was a very exciting time. It was characterized by exponential uh, growth. The digital stuff was already very hard to, to locate. And people were beginning to recognize that metadata for description, discovery, and management was becoming very important. You know, everybody uh, has heard of metadata these days. It's, it's, it's in the news a lot. But I have to point out that in that first year that we started using that term, we actually got a letter from a commercial concern that believed that they had, had, um, had uh, trademarked the term metadata. And they gave us, they sent us a cease and desist letter that we couldn't use that term. Well, happily, we ignored that. So, Again, the, the, the third aspect of why we succeeded, how we succeeded, is there were a lot of people out there who were very excited about making the web work better. And um, one of the things I'd say had, and characterizes the Dublin Core community is it was just full of people who were very excited to be working on these problems and were prepared to work very hard at it. We had uh, government organizations, national libraries, laboratories, business, uh, uh, businesses that all of whom recognized the importance of the World Wide Web and that the, the missing pieces needed to be addressed. So we started trying to do that. So how did we do it? Well, in the beginning, the first one, as I have already mentioned, was the Dublin Core. The NCSA OCLC metadata workshop is what we called it then. It didn't have a name other than that. And um, what Eric and I did when we went back to, uh, to Dublin, Ohio, 
was to try to identify the people, a collection of people that included uh, web technologists, that included uh, markup specialists like SGML and XML, um, content specialists and librarians to try to get them together to come to some agreements about the kind of standards. You know, the idea of descriptive metadata itself was not a new one. Libraries have been doing this for a very long time. The, the question was, how do we adapt some of those techniques to the web? So we started out with this invitational workshop. There were 52 people. And um, eventually, we, we, they got to be larger workshops. And then um, at some point, we actually started a conference uh, and a conference series. And we, one of the things that we recognize right at the start is it's the World Wide Web, not the Ohio-based web or the Europe-based web or the American-based web or the Asian web. And we knew that we had to hold our meetings and do our work all over the world. And you can see there just some of the lists of the places that we held our meetings. And so we did a lot of traveling. There were a number of years where I was the most traveled employee at OCLC. But we did our work. We couldn't meet to do all of our work, of course, all the time. So we had these meetings, but we had to work over email. And we all know now that email is as much a curse as it is a, a blessing. But it's what we had to do our work. And um, I, I, I've wondered of late, as I was preparing these slides, could we have done anything like this if all we had was, was virtual meetings and email. And it, it would have been very, very difficult because of course in virtual meetings, you don't have the chance to get to know each other, to have meals together, to go to the bar together and uh, to, to develop a measure of trust. And that's really an important part of the, uh, of the whole activity. So we had this meeting in, in Dublin March 1st to the 3rd in 1995, we ended up with a set of 13 elements that we thought were sufficient and important to do our work. That was later expanded to 15, but that's, um, you know, that was, uh, we, they haven't really changed very much from the early days. We agreed that they were intrinsic, that is to say those elements apply to the resource in hand. We agreed that they were extensible, that we weren't trying to elaborate every dimension of metadata that was going to be useful to people, nor could we even imagine doing so. We agreed that they were optional. You didn't have to use them all. They were repeatable. You could use, you know, you might have more than one uh, author to a, a particular a creator for a particular resource. And we agreed, of course, that they had to be uh, uh, modifiable. That is to say, we needed to be able to develop a set of qualifiers to sharpen the meaning of those uh, 13 elements. And one of the important things that I'll describe in just a moment is this notion of they had to be syntax independent. I don't know where where we first came up with the idea that that was so important, but boy, it turned out to be critical to our future. I think I mentioned we end up with 52 people that we invited to this workshop. And I'd have to say that these, these uh, principles that I've elaborated on the left-hand side of your screen have held up the test of time pretty well. Probably one of the most important things that we had at the end of that meeting was a brand. And um, Dublin Core, well, where did that come from? Well, we had the meeting at OCLC's headquarters in Dublin, Ohio, which is a suburb of Columbus. And for the first several years of our activity, if you typed in Dublin in the web, in the search box, you got Dublin Core above, right at the top, above Dublin, Ireland even. So we, we, made, we made a splash with it um, right, right from the start. Okay, that, that cardinal rule, thou shalt not discuss semantics and syntax in the same room. We agreed at the outset of that. We recognize that conflating the two was very important. And I think that this is a lesson perhaps that the librarians brought to the room. Mark standards, then the venerable standards of resource description in the library world, and still uh, the most important standard in the library world. 
has always muddled those ideas and it makes it very difficult to take the Marx standards apart and improve them in a way that we might like to as the world around us changes. So we didn't want to limit the expression of metadata to any given syntactic expression. Even at that point in time, those things were changing in the web very rapidly. So after that meeting, uh, Eric and I uh, you know, worked on articulating what we had uh, agreed upon and the 13 elements that were published in that first paper are on the screen now. And uh, all of those, again, they've grown to 15, but they're, they, they still work pretty well. Um, we didn't, we, we, we we didn't get everything right at that first meeting. So one of the things that we imagined that people would be happy to do, that the authors of uh, digital resources would be happy to do, is to create their own metadata, include them in documents. And we tried to make that easy. We were pretty wrong about that. It, it, A, it, it wasn't all that easy, and B, authors never really wanted to create their own metadata. Um, even though it's in the author's best interest for people to be able to find their stuff, it just wasn't a natural thing for people to do. And author-created metadata has really never been a major contribution uh, to metadata on, online. So ever since that first meeting, well, the basic semantics that we agreed upon we're pretty much okay. Certainly we've elaborated on it and um, argued about it interminably for many years. The syntax for declaring and sharing metadata was then, and I think still is, something of a moving target. What, what we had at the time was HTML and XML, and then eventually RDF came around. Um, and those things are, are still around, although there are, there are other aspects of, uh, of syntactic metadata as well. Probably, and I don't think we realized this as uh, well as we might have at the beginning, but the structure, the architecture of metadata is really the slipperiest part. It's the hardest for people to grasp in general, and it's the hardest to come to agreement about. The other thing that we've always struggled with, and I think every, uh, every major initiative does, is how to communicate what you're doing really to, to people out there that you're trying to convince it's important, but even to ourselves. And um, so what we've, we've struggled to do a lot of those things. Um, web infrastructure, as I said, we've got you know, three basic models of, uh, of uh, uh, encoding metadata on the web, HTML, XML, and RDF. And once you get into XML, you have to start managing schemas, and that becomes a whole um, large problem in and of itself. We've seen in recent years the development of open data, which is a very important thing for the for the uh, uh, development of the semantic web in particular. We've seen ontologies become more and more important. We didn't invent any of these things, of course, although many people who participated in the Dublin Core certainly had a major role in the development of these technologies. Eric Miller, my uh, partner in crime at OCLC, uh, uh, really managed the development of RDF for many years. Dealing with all these different kinds of web infrastructure was a little bit uh, like trying to fly an airplane while you're still designing it and building it in the air. It's really a difficult challenge and um, things were changing out from underneath this. And again, we didn't have a lot of uh, a staff to deal with the very important problem of communicating how you encode Dublin Core metadata into these various syntactic schemes. So one of the most important groups that we, that we had working on this was the, well, we've called it variously the data model working group or the architecture working group. And I can't remember which, which uh, was first, but um, there's an old joke about uh, uh, data modeling. You can string all the, we stole it from the economists, of course, you can string all the data modelers in the world together and you won't reach a conclusion. And that's what it felt like at times in these uh, architecture working group meetings or data model working group meetings. We changed the name from one to the other, I think 
you know, to kind of be rid of one and, and uh, kind of start over, if you will. They were very contentious working group meetings. Um, and it, mostly it was the web technologists that worked on this, but librarians as well. And what I have here is a couple of pictures that Tom shared with me about uh, uh, data modeling groups that, that we had over various years. So we had to, we weren't doing that good a job, even at convincing ourselves the way things ought to work, at least in a precise way. So we, we had to find ways to explain to ourselves and to explain to the rest of the digital world what we were doing. And if a, the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, a good metaphor is worth even more than that. So we have, you know, I'd just like to, uh, to cover some of the early metaphors that we used in the Dublin Core activities. And one of my favorites is Lego. There was an article in the New Yorker about Lego when we were working on this stuff and I, I read it and it was, it was a fascinating article. And one of the things I learned in that article was that the, th these toys are engineered to within about half of the precision required to engineer an internal combustion engine. And you think, why do you need that kind of precision? And I used to talk about uh, Legos snapping together with that satisfying click until uh, a colleague of mine, Tom Hickey, reminded me they don't click. So this sort of click, but, but the click isn't really the important thing about it. It's the way they fit together so nicely, they stay together. And um, over the many decades that Lego have been made, you can take the earliest Legos, many of you will have boxes of them in your toy rooms or your basement. You can take any Lego from 50 years ago and um, they'll work with the latest Lego sets that you have. And it's because of the engineering of those pieces that they fit together so nicely and they're basically future-proofed. So that's one of the ideas is you have to engineer the underlying structure so that it future proofs your metadata so that it works well over the years. And they're also extensible. So the latest uh, Star Wars uh, Lego set works perfectly fine with one from 50 years ago and your children develop the semantics for them and they'll invent semantics for those sets that the designers of Lego may have never dreamed of. And so that's what we wanted to achieve with extensible uh, uh, interoperable metadata is that sort of interoperability. So <clears throat> the second uh, uh, metaphor that, that uh, I think was a lot of fun, in Helsinki I bought one of these sets of, uh, of nesting dolls and um, you know you take them apart and, uh, and put them back together and it you know, it's a nice metaphor for the conveying the notion that the resources nest in that very same way. That um, uh, the, the things that we want to assign metadata for are hierarchical. Images are embedded in documents. Documents are embedded in monographs. Monographs are embedded in collections. Web pages are often part of collections or part of an organization. So you have that hierarchical aspect of metadata and it's very important to build the structures for metadata in a way that recognizes that hierarchical nature. Another uh, metaphor that uh, that I I, uh, I was struck by, on, on, I think it was after the meeting that we had in uh, Shanghai at the National Library of China. Um, I, I took a trip to Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, and it's a train trip, and it's uh, it, it's like going back in time. It was a very exciting trip to make. The border between China and Mongolia, the railroad gauges, the distance between the tracks are different on each side of the border. And that's by design. There's no, uh, there's not a lot of great trust built between Mongolia and China owing to a millennia of one or the other of crossing over to the border and having their way with the other side. So when they built the railroads, they were happy enough to leave the railroad gauges different. 
So you pull into this longhouse in the middle of the night in the Gobi Desert, and they jack up the entire train, and they roll out the bogies, the, the wheel sets for, for uh, one gauge, and they roll in the, the new gauge. And then they put the train back down on the bogies, and you go on your way. It, it, was, it was really <clears throat> quite an interesting thing to, to uh, experience. And um, it just occurred to me that for communities to share metadata, they have to have common infrastructure that run on the same gauges. Otherwise, you have to unload everything at one place, reload it into a different infrastructural system, and that's wasteful and uh, expensive and people don't want to do it. So um, I think that's a, a very apt metaphor for the uh, metadata age. Now, one of perhaps the most important metaphors that uh, we used in the Dublin core and this this comes from uh, Tom Baker's mind and it's about diagramming sentences and it's more than just uh, a meta metaphor it's really a model about the way metadata should work and it's been a very effective one that has sustained us ever since its introduction so if you look at these these two examples are of uh, structured metadata are represented in a way that um, that that sentence diagramming would take place in grammar schools in the United States. So you start out with a, a resource, a subject, if you will. There's an implied verb, a subject has some property, and those properties come from our basic 15 properties from the Dublin core, and then they each have a value. So a resource has a property of X. So that resource may have a DC date of, um, of, uh, well, I can't see what I've written there because uh, Samo's speaking block is right in the middle of it, but it has a date and it's expressed according to a particular standard, which is a modifier or a qualifier. So we have here the ability then to diagram in a graphic way um, the structure of how that metadata works. And that really this metaphor, this model, really, is, is what I think got us over the hump of data structures. It was something that certainly any American school child would have found familiar. Um, a further virtue of the system was that it fit very nicely into the emerging uh, idiom of RDF of the time. So uh, RDF is all about triples, as most of you watching this already know, I'm sure. Uh, there's an explicit subject, there's an implied verb, there are properties, and there are values. And those uh, triples are what are used to express information about uh, any particular resource. We had one little glitch with this, this uh, model or this metaphor, and that glitch is that uh, while all American children grew up diagramming sentences, nobody else in the world did, or very few other places uh, did. So, uh, you know, one of the things you want about a metaphor is that uh, you want it to be immediately recognizable to everybody. You don't want to have to explain the, the abstraction itself. But in spite of that, because of the strength of the notion of diagramming sentences and, and how it applies to metadata structures, the conceptual model of the grammar lives very comfortably in people's uh, minds, uh, familiar with the notions of knowledge graphs that predominate on the web and have for some time. So a related uh, language metaphor, if you will, is the notion of pidgin languages. And um, uh, Dublin Core's contribution to multilinguality on the web can be thought of as a, a pidgin language. So a pidgin language is a simplified version of a language that you can use to get everyday things done in two communities that don't speak the same language. And they've grown up all over the world throughout history. So we recognized that multilinguality was an essential aspect of what we were trying to achieve on the web, but we also recognized that it's impediment. So um, we want people to be able to express data in their own languages. And again, our, our, uh, our habit of having our meetings all over the world was an important one to the acceptance of, of metadata. People want to express metadata in their own languages, but we don't all speak the same language. And so 
Dublin Core, and, and I'll have to admit that, that the languages that we, uh, that we used in our work was, was lent English at, at our meetings, but we recognized that people wanted to develop metadata in their own languages. So we came to think of the basic DC metadata itself as kind of a pidgin language that people can agree to, to, uh, to exchange information with in a very simple uh, set of terms um, that uh, Ricky Irway, someone who was a colleague of mine at OCLC and uh, participated in some of these uh, meetings, invoked as an idea of a digital tourist. So you learn a few uh, basic terms to get around in an environment that speak in a different language. So that's not enough though. We know that you need more than just being able to share these 15 elements using the same language. So here's another idea that I, if I'm not mistaken, came from uh, Tom's head as well. Recurring theme here, I hope you'll uh, uh, recognize that. <clears throat> we developed this idea as, as, as a group that, um, that identifiers had to be uh, assigned, I'm sorry, metadata terms had to be assigned identifiers and they had to be maintained as such. So we might think of a, a creator as a, a, a Dublin core term, but, but creator is simply a token. And that token is associated with a permanent web addressable identifier that allows any piece of software or even a person to recognize that that creator has the same value as, as a creator expressed in a token from a different language. And <clears throat> it's, it's that notion of this I sent, uh, identi sorry, assigning URIs to metadata terms that has really become uh, one of the foundations for deploying metadata across languages throughout the world. And it's also critical uh, for machine readable metadata. So uh, machines, software can recognize terms uh, from their URIs and then they can make inferences based on that. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm coughing because Seattle has one of the uh, worst air qualities of any city in the world today. Uh, visibility is only a mile and uh, it's been pretty hard on us the last few days from the standpoint of breathing and speaking. So the slide you see in front of you today, I want to uh, uh, emphasize a couple of points about this. This is a document that um, has just been uh, revised and released in a current version this year, in January of this year. And there's information about that document there. The details of that information are not very important, but I want what I want to display with this is going back through uh, many releases of this document. It goes back to 2002. And so this document has had a release history that, that, that extends over 20 years. And somebody who wants to know the details of, of how it's changed, how the standard itself has changed, can go through back through those links and it's maintained. So it's an open, transparent standard. It's useful, of course, to the Dublin Core community, but it's, it's a notion that's used uh, in basically all metadata communities at this point in time. So the idea of assigning URIs to metadata terms goes back um, 20 years in our community. And it's a great idea. It's an essential idea, but you have to have more than the idea. You have to implement it. It has to be transparent and it has to be maintained. And because of the work that uh, Dublin Core Governors has, has invested in this, not just for this activity, but, but many of the other standards that we released, it is, uh, it's implemented, it's transparent, and it's maintainable. And that's absolutely critical for the future. So I think this is one of the great accomplishments that the Dublin Core has made to the community at large. And it all goes back to the ideas that Tom developed uh, 20 years ago. So what do we have after 25 years of Dublin Core metadata? Well, I, do, I like to divide the accomplishments that we made into infrastructure and social engineering. So the infrastructure, well, we have that core semantic layer 
that's in global use. It's the original elements. It's what we can think of effectively as pigeon metadata. It embodies a kind of Lego block extensibility that supports the enrichment of that core. We never imagined that, that those 13 or eventually 15 elements would be all the metadata that anybody wanted. We knew that people would want to add their own either local, locally enriched metadata or domain-based enriched metadata. So um, that's worked pretty well. It's an, a widely accepted model for assigning stable global identifiers to metadata terms, not only ours, but others. And it's a hard one understanding of metadata architecture that we argued about uh, vociferously at the early meetings, but it is spread widely both within and outside the Dublin core. So as an example of how it spread outside the Dublin core, Dan Brickley, who has attended several Dublin core meetings, I asked him, I was talking with him um, on Facebook uh, a few weeks ago, and I asked him, Dan, would you be willing to share a quote with me about the impact that you see Dublin core has made on the, the world of uh, metadata and schemas and such. Dan is the lead for schema.org, which is the underlying uh, quasi standards organization that supports all sorts of metadata schemas from companies all over the world, including Google. Um, so this is Dan's quote, DCMI's thinking and practice helped to shape the formal standards for linked data, for ontologies and the semantic web, as well as emerging approaches to data shapes and efforts at schema.org. So that's a pretty strong endorsement of the kind of work that we've done. And it's because we've had an open community, we welcomed everybody and their ideas, and we tried to support them whenever we could, that this kind of statement can be made. So some of the social engineering uh, achievements that we've uh, accomplished, I think, are things that I've alluded to already a little bit, but one was a governance model that is based on global collaboration, that we uh, support the evolution and maintenance of metadata. So um, that idea and that idea of, uh, of assigning URIs to our metadata, you know, part of that is purely infrastructure, but part of it is social engineering. It's encouraging the development of standards in a way that people can uh, see how they've been developed, who has worked on them, uh, how the ideas have evolved over time. And what that has allowed us to do is to support this globally inclusive, robust multilingual infrastructure that we have today. And the thing that Sam started off in his introduction to me, that is perhaps the most important contribution at all, is we have a global community of research and development. And that community itself, and here's another quotation by um, Dan, the core schemas of Dublin Core are at the heart of countless projects, systems, and initiatives, but they should also be treasured as practical talking points that brought us all together. And that's really the essence of that community part of it. And I, I, when I look back on it, it's certainly the most important thing to me. I continue to have and communicate co with colleagues all over the world that I've worked on with these. And that's the thing that Dan pointed to. He says, you know, when I look back on the Dublin Core, even more important than the metadata itself was the relationships that he developed with passionate people that worked on these ideas over many years and, and believed them to be uh, critical to the future, the future of the web and the future of uh, how societies work. So where does DCMI go from here? Well, the, you folks that are watching this presentation are really in charge of answering that question, not me. As I said, I'm a midwife, not an oracle. So your guess really is better than mine. Um, Take a look at the talks in, that are coming up over this virtual conference and you get some idea of where, where people are working. I noticed a couple of talks in the program that deal with metadata concern with um, uh, protest organizations and, and, and uh, developing more just uh, ways to extend the benefits of civilization. And I, I'm very, in this very difficult time that we're living through right now, 
uh, I'm very proud to see that. I think it's a, a great development for the community. So in the long term, it's the community, it's the people involved that are going to determine where the initiative goes. It's all about developing appropriate goals and, and making those work. You know, many years ago in the I think this is still true in the, in the uh, IETF, the in Internet Engineering Task Force. Every standard that was submitted uh, in the uh, IETF had to have a section that discussed the impact of the proposed standard on security. We need to think about that in the development of metadata, not so much about security, but what sort of impact are these metadata systems going to have on uh, the social engineering that's going on in the web. And I think all of us can agree right now that uh, social media is, uh, is as much a problem as it is a virtue these days. And so we need to be thinking about those activities. And we also need to recognize that we're talking about business models here. So we have to engineer metadata standards that serve business models, but they also have to serve social models. So we have a community. We can't lose sight in our isolation that the community is at the heart of the progress that we are trying to make. They're bigger than the sum of their parts. They have shared purposes. They have standards, not just technical standards, but social standards and how things should be put together. That is to say, they have values. They also have momentum and trajectory. And the fact that um, uh, a gray haired old man who uh, spends most of his time learning how to varnish these days and to sail his boat um, is talking to you today is a measure of that trajectory. And, and I hope it's a measure of the gravitational attraction that the community has for people. So my invocation to you is to look for those things among your peers, especially newcomers who are maybe uh, in the early stages of trying to develop ideas about metadata. Find those people and support them, nurture them, encourage them. So I'd like to give you a quote, uh, one of them, I think this is my next to last slide, <clears throat> a quote from a book called Sapiens, which I commend to your attention. It's a very interesting book. We believe in a particular order, not because it is objectively true, but because believing it enables us to cooperate effectively and for, and uh, to make a better society. And I, I have the picture I have in this slide is from one of our data modeling meetings. I think I used it in an earlier slide. We argued till we were blue in the face. We screamed at each other because we were all talking a little bit different language and couldn't quite agree on what structures and metadata could look like. We should have had this quote then. We should have understood better that we're not looking for objective truth. We're looking for a way to collaborate effectively. And that's what we have to find. And I think by and large, we've done a pretty good job of doing that. So I'll just finish by telling you there's nothing in my life that has compared with uh, the engagement that I've had with the Dublin Core community. And I'm very honored not only to have had that opportunity, but to be speaking to you today, 25 years after we started. I thank you for attending this virtual lecture. And I also want to thank uh, Tom Baker and Dan Brickley for their contributions to this presentation. And with that, I wish you an excellent uh, virtual conference. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this was wonderful. And the, I do not see any Q&A questions from the window. So I'll open or anyone would like to ask questions to Stu. You can. Hi, this wait. is, yeah. this is, this is Tom. I, I'd like to um, mm. just ask a, a question. Uh, first of all, I wanted to remind people that they can uh, type questions in the Q&A box. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask about five years after the Dublin Core started, um, there was the sudden rise of, of Google search. Um, uh, how did that affect, um, as you recall, how did that affect the, the way that, um, uh, that the Dublin Core community saw the role of search or role of metadata? 
Well, that, that's a great question. And I think when Google uh, started and then became so uh, wildly successful, we uh, rapidly came to the understanding that metadata wasn't just about search. It was as much as anything else, it was about organization. And uh, I think that that's true. So, you know, for one thing, search is, is really is just full text in indexing, just. It's full text indexing on a global scale. <clears throat> and I doubt that there's any of us who don't use it every single day and are not grateful for the work that Google has done to make that possible. But using the same term to search, you're not going to find multilingual representations of your terms that you're searching on. You're not going to find synonyms necessarily. Um, so what what the value of metadata then turns out to be relating different concepts and especially through the ability to relate them through uh, URIs, through uh, uh, globally uh, unique identifiers. And so we came to recognize as time went on that, um, yeah, we weren't going to be the central uh, uh, technology for search, which is sort of what we imagined at the beginning but that it was still critically important for the organizational aspects of resources. And for uh, organization, I don't mean uh, just uh, how you uh, sort them into boxes, but how you access them through ontologies. So ontologies and um, RDF and the semantic web have uh, all come together in the formation of open linked data which gives you the ability to do much richer things than simple keyword search. And I, I say that without demeaning in any way the, the critical importance of that uh, keyword search. Okay. Any other questions to Stu? Uh, you can either type in your Q&A windows or you can uh, raise your hand and we can allow you to speak. You can also send me email if you think of something later. I'm I'm uh, okay. I'm fine with that. I used to, you know, when we used that system called the M bone. Um, yeah. I used to every time I was on the M bone, I put up the third email I get at this email address. I'll send you a ten dollar bill to see if anybody <laughs> is listening. I never had to pay off. <laughs> okay, and this is a, a follow -up question from Stuart Sutton and Stu. Here is a follow up. Uh, on the Google question, and could you address the fact that Google is moving more and more to structure metadata for results and products developed to shape search results? Well, I, I, I can't really say much about how Google does its business, except <laughs> to say um, they do it based on um, uh, metadata schemas and the ideas that have been developing in our metadata community for the past 25 years. So I wish there was a way we could convince Google to share some of their wealth with us to, to uh, in, increase the, the effectiveness of that sort of research, but um, uh, that's probably not very likely to happen. Okay, then Marina, I think you can you can now you can ask question. Marina Lopez. Marina, I think you're muted. Yeah. The great curse of Zoom. <laughs> uh, and I'll go to Shigeo first, then I'll come back to Marina. Shigeo. Okay. Oh, I need to allow to talk. Okay. Ohio Gazamas. Yeah. <laughs> Shigeo, now you can talk. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I, I enjoyed this uh, historical talk. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I learned about the, how say, the very beginning of the, uh, the web meeting, uh, at the very beginning of the Dublin Core. So, yeah. Um, I want to ask you, what was the most impressive meetings? Maybe uh, the most impressive meeting, there are three impressive meetings for you oh, among okay. the, uh, the long history of the, workshop, uh, the workshops and also the mm -hmm. conferences. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so I, I, I'm, oh boy. 
<laughs> the most impressive meeting. Well, I, I can tell you, I can, I can answer that question maybe by telling you what was the most terrifying meeting. <laughs> okay, so, yes. So that may be a stand-in for the best. Um, the first three workshops were, for me as the organizer, were absolutely terrifying before I came to understand how they worked. You know, when I started organizing these workshops, if some, the only way I could be invited to a, a workshop on, on, on uh, metadata would be to organize it because I didn't have any standing in the field and I never organized a workshop. And so we organized these workshops and we were just kind of winging it. We were kind of doing it on, on uh, uh, a wing and a prayer. And, <clears throat> <laughs> what happened in these workshops, the first three in particular, is they were absolutely terrifying because they'd start to fall apart about, they were usually two and a half days, and they'd start to fall apart the end of the second day. And, uh, and so I'd go to bed that night and I'd realize, holy mackerel, I have no idea whether this thing is just going to completely fall apart. And what happened is people rec other people recognized that too, and they recognized that they had to come to an agreement, especially the first three meetings. If we had uh, fallen apart and not come to some conclusions, we simply would have stopped. No nobody would have paid any attention to us. So we knew we needed a, a deliverable, and to, to have a deliverable, we needed to have some agreement. And coming to those agreements in those meetings was difficult. And uh, I, you know, I've made a number of revolutions to the working, uh, working group meeting on architecture. And boy, the same thing in those. We got together for those meetings and literally there were times when people were screaming at each other. I've never seen anything like it and I hope to never again. Um, but in the end, we always came out with a deliverable. So, um, so for me, the success of the meeting was what is our deliverable? And is it, is, it, is it a plausible story that we have to tell to the rest of the community that shows that we're making products, progress? And all of the early meetings in particular were, uh, they were really scary experiences, but they were also very, uh, they were very exciting experiences. And the fact that we got all these people that spoke different languages, and I mean different technical languages, the web technologists, the librarians, the content specialists, and we got all those people to agree on things. That was deeply satisfying. And you know, after you know, months of work and then three days of terror, to finish those meetings exhausted and yet having a deliverable in hand that we could share with the world, that was, that was very, very exciting. Thank you very much. The, the Marina Lopez, uh, if you, um, can you unmute or you can uh, ask question or not? Okay. I will go to, here's from the Nishad. Stuart, thank you for the uh, beautiful history of 25 years. My question is, uh, do you have any different perspective or thought about any of the following questions of the past it evolved? Uh, do I have, uh, let me see if I can understand what you're asking. Do I have any questions about how specific thoughts about how specific issues developed and either got resolved or, you know, one way or another? Is that the sense of the question? I am trying to make sense of Nishad, where is Nishad? Okay, I'm going to allow, Nishad, could you clarify your question? Hi, Stuart, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a really uh, nice, beautiful history of DCMI. Mm -hmm. And uh, newcomers like me, it was like a real good um, short history of metadata as well. So my question is, uh, uh, looking back to past 25 years, do you have any different thoughts or perspectives that things should be, uh, things should be evolved or, or things evolved so far? So I mean, like as a, as a person who walked through or walked with it for last 25 years, do you have any different thoughts that there may be some, something else should be done at that point or something like that? <laughs> You know, it, 
I think what I understand you to be asking me is uh, what could we have done differently and would it have worked better? Yes. And, and the answer is yes. Um, there are some things. And, and uh, those of you who have been around this activity for a while will, uh, will recall at, at the meeting we had at the Library of Congress, and that was probably the sixth or seventh meeting, something like that. Um, some people came up with what I thought at the time was a very good proposal. And it was to, it was, we called it the secret agent proposal because the idea was to combine a couple of elements in the original set that referred to creators as uh, agents, as a more abstract uh, representation. And holy mackerel, was that a hornet's nest? Um, so w basically what the problem was is we were already, f I don't know, five or six years into this, and there was a lot of legacy uh, metadata out there and that, um, people have been working in. And, and so we were asking ourselves, have we understood the abstraction of the metadata set well enough, or could we improve upon it? And I think what a lot of us decided, I certainly was of the opinion that we could improve upon it. And, and we had it in mind to change the element set at that late date. And we knew that if we did that, we were going to break a lot of people's applications. And so we didn't. Would the Dublin core be better if we had done so? The answer is yes, I think. But going back to this idea that we believe in a particular order, not because it is objectively true, but because believing it enables us to cooperate effectively. And so we ended up not changing it and we left it and it, you know, might have been a little bit better if we'd have changed it. But but we didn't want to endanger the substantial community of people who had already developed things based on the original set. I'm sure there are lots of other uh, aspects of this that, that we could have done differently as we went along, but I, that's the one that sticks out in my mind the most. Here is the question from MC from Canada. Stu, thank you for sharing your memory. What were the greatest challenges uh, that were met in developing the element set? And what do you see the greatest challenges and opportunities for the, for the future? And also, to which DC related breakthrough are you most proud of? Which breakthrough am I most proud of? You know, I, I guess I have to go back to the first meeting. And, um, you know, we, we invited a bunch of people together trying to understand what was going on in the web and how we could make it work better. And the, the first accomplishment was simply to leave that meeting after two and a half days and have something to present those 13 elements. And again, not necessarily the perfect set of elements, but a set of elements that everybody could agree would be useful in helping people find things on the web. And we, we, we had this notion of a document-like object. We were, we were thinking here of describing um, electronic resources. And of course, we all know that we all recognize now that electronic resources, that's a bro as broad as, you know, there's an enormous diversity of things out there on the web that we hoped uh, to describe with metadata. And we recognized at the beginning that that diversity existed. <clears throat> and we didn't know exactly how to describe it. So we had this term, a document-like object. So a notion that you could pick up something in hand and you could uh, describe it in a way that would help other people find it. And so that was a bit of an abstraction and, and, uh, and uh, bringing all of these people from different environments together to agree on the shape of that abstraction and how it should work, I think was an enormous accomplishment. And the fact that we really changed it very little I think we, we added, I think the very next meeting, we added two additional elements and it never changed beyond that. Of course, we developed qualifiers and, and, and structure and all of that, but that, you know, we, we were roughly right in what we did in that first meeting and that carried us a, a very long way. So that's one of the things that I think that we did well. And the other thing that I'm, I'm uh, one of the two other things that I'm really most proud of is that we, 
we recognized that we had to make this an international activity. The, San, the fact that Sam O is sitting in Korea at, uh, after midnight participating in this and saying these kind words about me, and uh, Shigeo is in Japan, and, and, and uh, Tom is in, in Germany, and Paul is in, and I don't know, you know, in England, and, and I don't know where the rest of you are, but we made it an international activity, and we, and we developed and this again, it goes back to Tom's efforts and we developed a way to make, make it possible for people to do metadata in, this, in, their, in their own languages. And I think that's, that may be the single biggest technological contribution that we've made to the web is that multilinguality. Here is a question from the uh, students. I'm an ML, MLIS student and completing a practicum in which I am studying metadata practices and learning how to uh, transform records. What advice do you have for those of us who are just beginning this journey? Well, I, I guess my advice to you um, is, well, not, nothing that I have to say anymore will be of any use to you. I, I can teach you how to varnish, however, if you're interested. <laughs> in You'll have to come to Seattle, though. But, you know, what I said, you know, in these very difficult times that we're all isolated, and I think that as a student today is facing particular challenges in developing your career and developing the ideas that you think are important, I would strongly urge you to be relentless in seeking out allies in developing your ideas. And, and again, those of us who have been around for a very long time, it's our responsibility to nurture people like you because that's how, you know, that's how we future-proof metadata is to encourage among uh, students uh, who are trying to find a way to make the world work better uh, to encourage the ideas that you have and to, to uh, provide gentle guidance in, in uh, nurturing those ideas and bringing them to the attention of people who can make them, who can build them into systems, who can adopt them. And um, so, the, you know, part of it's your responsibility, of course, is to study things and understand them as best you can and to find ways to make them better. But a big part of that responsibility falls on us, the older people who have been around a long time and want to make this stuff work. And in this difficult time where we can only communicate over Zoom, um, you know, you've got to look for those people and, um, uh, you know, look for the young people and help nurture them and do things that are, uh, uh, that'll help them develop their ideas. And so that's, that's the challenge I have for the future is to make that community work as best as it can. Okay, all good things must come to an end. But is, uh, do you have any one final uh, burning question that's I want to take just one, if you have one? Me? Raise it. If you, no, no, to, to anyone. Uh, well, if, if, if you have any oh, no, I, I final agree. word to us. No. Yeah. Um, but, then what are really the feeling uh, keynote it was to celebrate our 25th anniversary. It was a truly excellent uh, keynote and uh, this, we are so grateful um, to your talk. Let's give uh, a, a big round of applause to him and thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate being here. Um, it's been a real thrill for me to participate. Thanks. Okay. It was a wonderful, it's a wonderful start. We'll have a, a great conference ahead and uh, we invite you to join us uh, tomorrow again. And uh, please, uh, let's make this exciting, uh, exciting time together. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.